Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Asia Scotland Institute uh, webinar this afternoon. Good afternoon in Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, good afternoon also in Afghanistan and, and welcome to this event. Uh, my name is Martin Pobrick. I'll, I'll moderate the discussion today. Uh, with us on the panel video, you can see in front of you, uh, we have uh, Roddy Gao, chairman and founder of the Asia Scotland Institute. Also uh, Rick Minchon, the head of development at Asia Scotland Institute. Uh, where we're delighted to be joined again by our partner, Lady Olga Maitland, President of the Defence and Security Forum, which is co-hosting this event with us today. Uh, also assisting both organisations to organise the event, we have uh, Martin Ramani, Executive Director of the Afghanistan US Democratic Peace and Prosperity Council, uh, currently based in Washington DC, I believe. Um, we have a very important discussion today. The, the focus is the future of Afghanistan. This is obviously extremely timely. Uh, it's been reported just this week that the withdrawal of US and NATO forces from Afghanistan is set to be completed by mid-July, which is far earlier than President Biden's uh, September the 11th deadline. The deadline date itself, of course, is rather contentious in whether that was appropriate. Uh, withdrawing troops is probably the relatively easy part of the situation, but there are related issues such as the safety of local Afghani people who have worked for the US and, and its allies, the effective continued defense of key towns uh, and also security for foreign embassies in the country. Most importantly, of course, is the safety of the Afghan people and what happens to them after international forces withdraw. Um, and it's most appropriate that we have Afghan people with us here today to talk about uh, what's happening now and what will happen in the future. Um, I'll give just very brief introductions to each of them. Uh, Mr. Haji Ajmal Rahmani is a member of the Afghanistan parliament representing the people of Kabul. Uh, he serves as the common coordination leader, which is the majority whip of parliament, uh, to build consensus amongst MPs, uh, which, as we discussed earlier before you came on, is, is quite a job, I can assure you. Uh, Mr. Rahmani holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Kabul University and a Master's in Business Administration from Holt International Business School in London. Uh, secondly, we'll have Mir Haida Afzali, also a member of the Afghanistan parliament, representing the people of Kapisa. He serves as the chairman of the Defence Commission, where he leads efforts to end corruption and mismanagement by the government of Afghanistan and the Afghanistan National Defence and Security Forces. He has a bachelor's degree in architecture uh, from Kabul Polytechnic University and a master's degree in management from Azad University. Um, lastly, also from Afghanistan, Mr. Nahid Farid, is a member of the Afghanistan parliament also representing the people of Herat. She serves as the chair of the Human Rights, Civil Society and Women's Affairs Commission. Uh, she became the youngest person ever to be elected to the Afghanistan parliament in 2010 at the age of 27. Quite an extraordinary achievement at that age, obviously. Uh, she holds degrees from Herat University and also a master's in international relations from George Washington University uh, and an honorary doctoral degree in public administration. Uh, and, and lastly, from the panelists, we'll, we'll hear from out of Afghanistan from uh, a regular commentator, Brigadier Ben Barry, former director of British Army staff in the UK Ministry of Defence and author of the Army's Lessons Learned Analysis of Post-Conflict Stabilisation of Iraq. But his most recent book, Blood, Metal and Dust, How Victory Turned into Defeat in Afghanistan and Iraq, does talk in depth about what went wrong for US, UK and allied forces in Afghanistan and how we can learn from that. And we'll ask him about the military outlook. Um, so panelists, please, could we ask you to give some opening remarks? Uh, and, and if we could first go to um, Haji Akmal Ramani, uh, over to you, sir, please. Thanks for warm introductions and thanks for the Asia Scotland Institute and the Defense and Security Forum, especially Lady Olga Maitland for organizing this most timely event. As you all aware, the US, UK, and NATO coalition troops withdrawal is well underway. Within a few short months, all of the troops will return home. Let me be clear. We respect the decision made by our NATO allies and we cherish their enduring commitment and tremendous sacrifice in blood and treasure on behalf of people of Afghanistan. However, the troops withdrawal has caused an immediate destabilizing effect. The Taliban has escalated its already devastating nationwide campaign of terror and violence and doubled down on its winner-take-all demands in peace negotiations. 
The government is engaged in fledging attempts to assemble a unified front despite skepticism and fear among many ethnic and regional groups, grievances that are only exaggerated by the government's self-inflicted political wounds. Afghanistan rests on the tip of a knife, and the troop withdrawal can plunge our country into a deadly civil war with, with implications for national, regional, and global security stability. The withdrawal uh, threatens the mutual interest we share with US, UK, and NATO allies, including counterterrorism, democracy, women's rights, human rights, peace, and economic development. My colleagues and I have developed a list of 10 recommended actions for our NATO allies to take in order to help us avert a catastrophic situation. I encourage all of you to review and strongly consider these recommendations, which can be found at dppc.org. While Afghanistan undoubtedly needs sustained financial, military, diplomatic, and humanitarian support from the US, UK, and NATO allies, equally important to Afghanistan's future is our ability to get our, our own house in order. Corruption is a real threat to our democracy that plagues our ability to generate revenue and realize the full benefits of generous financial assistance from our allies and donors. It also threatens the ability of the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces. Our democracy's, last line, uh, our democracy's last line of defense to defend and fight against the Taliban and terrorist groups. I developed a structured knowledge, global understanding and skills through high quality Western education and completed my MBA at London, UK, and now as a majority whip of parliament and as, as a member of the generation under 40 years old, that makes up more than 70% of the country's population. I know we as a nation can do better and we must do better. When this parliament was sworn into office two years ago, I helped my father, the speaker, build a centrist majority coalition of male and female MPs from every ethnic group and region of the country committed to tangible action and government reform. Our coalition includes many young leaders in parliament, including those who chair our most powerful committees especially my colleagues here with me today. In the past two years, Parliament has demonstrated through both our words and our nation, uh, and both uh, our words and our actions that we will uh, faithfully fulfill our constitutional obligations to conduct oversights uh, through audits, investigations, and hearings. We work transparently, relying on Afghan media and social media to share information and receive feedback from our people. Parliament has identified and publicized the root causes of corruption in the government's revenue collections, budgeting and spending practices. Beyond just pointing out the problems, we also have taken a step to resolve them by enacting legislative and policy changes and ministerial level personal changes through several no confidence votes. Despite our best efforts, we cannot compel the government to implement the changes parliament has voted into law. Parliament fears that if the cycle of corruption persists, it will foster apathy and eventually cause our allies to cut, cut off funding. As we enter this next phase of UK-Afghan relations, we are Afghanistan will need to stand on its own two feet. Whether the support of troops on the ground, I strongly encourage the UK government and parliament to cooperate with my colleagues and I by participating in a uh, collaborative oversight and outcomes-based funding approach. Coming to the peace process and negotiation with the Taliban, Parliament has seriously concerns about lack of progress in Doha. A question on everyone's mind is if the Taliban can be trusted, if they are truly interested in peace, and if they would ever agree to become part of the Republic. I believe that the question that the international community should be asking is how we get the Taliban back to the negotiation table and earnestly participating in the peace negotiations. Right now, the Taliban is focused on war. Since the troops withdrawal was announced, the Taliban escalated their violent attacks and attempts to size districts and provincial capitals. In the past month, the Taliban has taken control of four districts and they are waging attacks across multiple districts and many provinces. The Taliban believes they can defeat the Afghan Republic on battlefield and take over the country by force. But the NDSF is a capable fighting force that can stop Taliban advances on the battlefield and recapture territory under Taliban control. 
with the appropriate financial, logistical, training, and intelligence gathering support from the US, UK, NATO allies, and their contractors, the NDSF can stop the Taliban's military advances. A strong NDSF gives the Afghan Republic peace negotiators leverage, and it can compel the Taliban back to the negotiating table. The parliament is 100% committed to peace. After concerns among MPs and the public about the government's sincerity in pursuing a peace agreement, parliament acted to directly engage in the process and facilitate a sustainable peace agreement. Earlier this year, we formed a special committee to oversee the peace process, which includes one MP from every province. In the first hearing of this committee, the speaker was the first public official to bring forth and publicize a proposal for a power sharing agreement with the Taliban that had been circulating on the sidelines of Doha. The speaker became a member of the High Council for National Reconciliation, the body that oversees the Republic's negotiating team. Ms. Uh, Naid Farid, our MP, she's also with us today, and several of our other MPs and my uh, colleagues, Mr. Abdali Saif also, uh, provide direct consultation to the negotiating team. The parliament has worked to strengthen the regional consensus for peace by meeting with legislators, political and military leaders in neighboring countries, including Pakistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and Turkey. At the Moscow talks, the speaker met with the Taliban leadership and opened a communications channel between the parliament and the Taliban. Our constitutions gives parliament the authority to ratify and support the implementation of any peace agreement beyond our legal imperative. We have a strong public support and trust. Political capital we earned through two years of de delivering on promises and being transparent. Our role in peace process is to serve as an honest broker for the Afghan people delivering on the peace they so badly desire, but maintaining a strong NDSF and not allowing compromises beyond the red lines of a democratic system, women's rights, human rights, and free speech. Mr. As the UK... Uh, Mr. Romani, um, so, sorry to interrupt. I think you've, you've just hit on um, a, a key point for a handover, if you don't mind. Uh, you just mentioned women's rights and human rights and free speech. W would you mind if we come back to some more comments from you a little bit later? But on, on that point in, in your opening remarks, could we go across to Ms. Farid? Because um, I think you've just- Perfect. Yeah, thank you very much. You've just, really good. You just made the very nice introduction to her. No problem. Yeah. Do I was almost done, but it's, we can hand over to my colleague. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, I, I do apologize. Uh, Ms. No Nahid Farid, um, I, I know you're comfortable now in, in Kabul. We, we'd really like to hear from you, please. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it is my true honor and pleasure to be uh, in this panel. I uh, say a hi to my colleagues in uh, Afghanistan Parliament and also everyone who is hearing us and the panelists. Uh, let me thank uh, Asia Scotland Institute and Martin Purbrick, the director of ASI and the event moderator for hosting this event. And this very important event, uh, I, wanna, I wanna thank Lady Olga Maitland of the Defense and Security Security Forum for organizing this event. And also I want to thank you and your country's uh, support and standing with the people of Afghanistan, understanding um, the situation in the last two decades, um, walking the uh, path of democracy and nation building um, and counterterrorism mission with us in the last two decades. Um, I recognize that on behalf of the people of Afghanistan. And also I want to use the opportunity to express the level of women's sentiment and concerns and perspective in Afghanistan on the US and UK and NATO troops withdrawal um, and, uh, and uh, the level of the pessimis pessimism and sadness and disappointment that people of Afghanistan are having. Uh, and at the same time, they're very committed to preserve and fight for our rights. But we are very alarmed uh, by the pl planned withdrawal of the US and NATO and other inter international forces. Uh, not only this will negatively impact on the peace process, it is the Afghan people who will suffer the most uh, from any further um, decision and also the withdrawal. And we need the continuous support, uh, which is highly required in order to ensure that Afghanistan does not descend into further crisis and become once again a safe haven and breeding ground for terrorist groups. Um, 
it is very important to have agreements with regional players, particularly Iran and Pakistan, um, uh, to, to ensure that they will not interfere in the internal affairs of Afghanistan, but they should be very helpful in the process. We also, um, on behalf of women of Afghanistan, um, having my, my um, position as a Women Affairs Commission Chair, uh, I want to um, highlight the fact that we worry that the women, they, that, that the outcome of the withdrawal and the peace with the Taliban will be a return of mid-90s and even a civil war in Afghanistan. If the human rights of the people are violated, if women are imprisoned in their homes, if the free will of the people, especially women, in determining their political destiny is ignored, and the expression of modern and advanced beliefs and concept of Islam that promotes coexistence with all human beings will be suppressed. I believe that a civil war will happen in Afghanistan. The cost will be paid by Afghanistan people and also for the, by the world because all countries in the globe have shared interest in counter-terrorism mission. Um, um, we also have initiatives in Afghanistan parliament in, um, in my committee. Uh, we have a series of parliamentary town hall for inclusive peace to ensure women's rights, human rights, civil society. They remain red lines in the peace process. They are not crossed as part of any political sat settlement with, with the Taliban. And, and uh, I, I wanted to highlight this in my, my, in my speech to, to let you know that we have uh, contacted so many parliaments in the region and in the world to let them know that they have to uh, stand, they have the mission to stand with the people of Afghanistan. And we understand that the road to peace is long. The countless civilian casualties, daily attacks, the targeting of civil society and peace activists cannot continue if peace is to be achieved and sustained in Afghanistan. Throughout Afghanistan, people desperately want peace and have rallied in support of it, but they must see some positive signs, some indications of process and progress from Taliban if they are willing for peace is real and if the group wishes to continue uh, this process. From beginning until now, the Taliban has not kept a single promise. They have not been held accountable or taken responsible for their actions that destroyed the lives of so many people, civilian soldiers. They celebrated rather than arrest those members who commit atrocities against innocent Afghans. In Taliban controlled areas of the country, they burned down schools. They burn down girls' schools. They close media outlets. They shut down women's organization. How can we trust that they will act on any commitment regarding the peace process? In order to show good faith, we demand the Taliban and we ask our international allies to influence them, to put the pressure on them, to agree an immediate ceasefire, an immediate ceasefire that lead country towards a real peace. Um, uh, you know, we have to have women uh, being part of a democratic process uh, to be successful process, to be, to be a durable process, process, especially in a country like Afghanistan that suffered a devastating setback under the Taliban regime. I grew up under Taliban rule with no access to education and basic rights. Taliban kept girls and women blind. We didn't know what was the meaning of right as the fundamental basic of human being's existence. Today, situation is totally different from Taliban regime. That experience, the, the, the life under to, totally barbaric regime of Taliban inspired me and so many other women to become life changers in Afghanistan, to be, become agents of change. I, I became an advocate for women rights and it led me to become an MP and voice the concerns of Afghan women and human rights uh, and, hu and human being uh, to make sure that darkness, that blindness and that oppression never happens again uh, in Afghanistan. We are fighting for that. Let me emphasize on the, on the predictions that will happen in Afghanistan um, uh, and in the region and in the world if the US and UK and NATO uh, does not put a strong focus on protecting the rights of and safety of women of Afghanistan and girls of Afghanistan. In such a situation, the country will fall under the extremism 
under the fundamentalism and global terrorism uh, groups will re-emerge and will rebuild their safe haven on our terrorist territories. And, and people won't have access to their basic rights. And as a result, we will have a war to society that affected by civil war and no one has access to, to their basic rights. And this situation will demand another intervention of international uh, community and NATO allies with more cost, with more prices, the world has to come back to Afghanistan. Um, I, at the end, I want to make the, uh, the uh, two very more, uh, three actually, uh, most important actions that the uh, US and UK and NATO can take to support Afghan women. First, make the right of women and girls a non-negotiable requ requirement for international support of a peace and power sharing agreement with the Taliban. Afghan women should not be forced to jeopardize gains or rights. World has to be committed to a genuine and sincere peace process so that the negotiations succeed and preserve women's rights and gains made over the last 20 years. Also, the second um, issue that I wanted to highlight is that we have to make Taliban accountable. So they commit to a comprehensive ceasefire to demonstrate their will towards a political settlement and their commitment to a meaningful peace in Afghanistan. And three, we ask our international allies to continue funding and training of our Afghan national defense and security forces, but work with the parliament as well to combat corruption, to, come, to have the oversight and to force real government reform in Afghanistan. At the end of a hope for the future, as women of Afghanistan, it still shines broadly in our hearts, in our minds. We count on you, on our international friends to support us in our mission and to end the violence and not to allow any short-sighted policies to jeopardize the right and lives of Afghan women and all people of Afghanistan. Ms. Farid, thank you very much. I should say uh, your, your very precise and very passionate comments, uh, I think, highlight um, the issues. And, and with the introduction from Mr. Romani as well, we, we can see the great risks ahead. Um, could, could we please switch across to um, Mir Haider Afzali? Um, Mr. Afzali, we, we'd like to hear from you next. Um, please give us your views on, on what you think needs to happen next in Afghanistan. Thank you very much. Um, hello to everyone, my colleagues and people who are hearing me. Let me thanks from ACI Scotland Institute and Martin Perbrick, the director of ASI and even moderator for hosting this evening. And also let me thanks uh, Lady Olga Midland, Defense and Security Forum for uh, organizing this event. Uh, from the time being, which the uh, troops withdrawal started from Afghanistan, Taliban took a plan to collapse some uh, center of the province in Afghanistan, especially they targeted five provinces in south of Afghanistan. Uh, uh, they started their, their attacks on that provinces. Fortunately, the, the NDSF defeated them in battlefield, but unfortunately, we lost um, five districts of Afghanistan and it's right now under control of the Taliban plus the district which they were under the control of the Taliban previously. Um, in, in more than 102 districts, we are um, witness of um, um, attacking Taliban on the um, governmental officials and the civilians. In, in conclusion, I can say that we are witness that in more than 102 districts, we have violence and war right now ongoing in, in different provinces of Afghanistan. In, in last three years, Taliban performed more than 3,500 different types of attacks. Uh, I, when I say different types of attacks, I mean uh, from, it starts from the road bombs, from suicide attacks, directly attacks on the NDSF, and so many other things. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, Taliban, uh, sorry, unfortunately, Taliban didn't reach to their plan. They couldn't um, uh, collapse the center of a major province like Helmand and, and Oregon or, or any other provinces. Um, what is very important that it, it is that the, the Taliban has a close connection with the uh, Al Qaeda and ISI and ISL and Daesh. I mean. Uh, <clears throat> In some province, they perform their attacks in coordination with each other, and still they are not disconnected. 
It is, it's a big threat uh, for the region and also for international community that the Taliban are still in, connect, in connection with the, with the Al-Qaeda and, and Daesh. Uh, our NDSF forces resistance uh, was remarkable and appreciable in last uh, two months especially after the withdrawal is thought from uh, uh, Afghanistan. In, in, in they had performed an appreciable works and they defeated Taliban in battle. But there are still some points that I want to mention uh, to be considered in the future. The first thing, it's important that our uh, uh, aviation force um, uh, is uh, uh, very powerful right now. A huge part of the war is on the shoulder of our aviation forces. In our aviation force, we have more than 150 different types of aircrafts. Daily, we are performing between 60 to 70 flights in, in uh, all uh, around Afghanistan. These flights are, some of them are for evacuation of the martyred and injured from the battlefield. Some of them is for logistical supply because you know, that um, um, in the in the war condition, it is impossible to reach with some bases that we have in different parts of Afghanistan by the roads. Therefore, um, uh, we um, uh, um, we supply our ANDSF in various parts of Afghanistan by the ear. Another thing which is very important, it is the ear strike. It has a vital role on the defeating of the Taliban in the battlefield. I can tell you that if our aviation force to stop their operation, even though either for one day, the, the situation will be changed. And they have a vital role on the, on the battle of Afghanistan. Another positive and important thing in the battle and in the war is that we have more than 36,000 uh, special forces which are unique in the region. And I can tell you that these um, um, special forces are um, uh, equipped with the, um, uh, developed and improved weapons and they are well trained and they have the capability to, to defeat the Taliban in, in various parts, especially in the last two months, they have deployed and they have dispatched in the areas and in, in, the, in the field which they um, needed support and they played a vital role plus our aviation force and the, the battlegrounds. Uh, uh, what we want from the international community is that, that the first we want them that they have they, they maintain the range of support that right now it is going on on our NDSF. I mean that annually we receive more than five billion US dollars for our NDSF. At least we have to maintain this um, amount of money uh, up to that time that our NDSF stand on their own foot. The other thing is, which is very important, it is our aviation um, forces. You know that the contract of the maintaining and repairing of the, our aircraft is, is still with the, some foreigner contracts, especially with the American contractors. And still we didn't find any replacement for them. And I can tell you that if they withdraw and they, if they leave, the, the, our aviation force will um, um, face with a big challenge because we didn't find any replacement for them. And we want these contractors remains up to that time that we find a, a replacement of these contractors for our aviation forces. Other problems that right now we are facing, unfortunately, it is the issue of ammunition. Unfortunately, in heavy ammunition, we, we, are, we have some challenges, especially in rocket missiles, RPG, uh, and also in the, in the aviation rockets that it is very useful and it is very um, efficient uh, for, for defeating of the Taliban. We want from international community to support us by ammunition. Other problem we have, unfortunately, it is the vehicles. Um, unfortunately, in, in, in 2021, uh, we received just more than one, uh, 350 homeless for the army of Afghanistan. We didn't receive any uh, vehicles for the police of Afghanistan. It's a big challenge. You know that daily we lost some of our vehicles in the car bombs in the, in the battlefields. And uh, in 2021, unfortunately, we didn't have any uh, special support in the, in the, um, in the vehicles. Other support with, which we need for our NDSF is intelligence support, especially uh, intelligence ears and supports. Uh, I mean, uh, drones that the Americans and foreigners, which they have in Afghanistan, and it is very useful in, in capturing the Taliban and, and positions and in capturing the Taliban um, um, GPS and the, the coordinates, and they give uh, uh, it to us and the aviation support, aviation um, targeted the Taliban and, and that fields.
This is the things that we are, we are we unfortunately need the support of the international community up to that time that our end is to stand on their own. Let's come to that. What is what we are doing right now in, the, in this work foundation? The first thing, as a member of the parliament and as the Defense Affairs Committee, that we have responsibility of supervision of the ANDSF um, and these ministries, is that that we uh, we are right now giving moral for our ANDSF. We make our connection very close to our ANDSF with our soldiers, with our officers through the grounds. Because daily we receive many calls from various parts of Afghanistan. They share their problems with us, and we share their problems with the leadership of the ANDSF, especially Ministry of Defense and Ministry of Interior. I mean that we are working like a bridge between the um, NDSF leadership and the and the and the um, NDSF soldiers because we, we um, sometimes they cannot reach to their leaderships. This is the first thing that we are doing. The second thing that we uh, go through the grounds and we have some trips through the uh, bases and we go to the very low level of these soldiers and we uh, give them moral to uh, stand on their feet to battle and uh, in in the field and and to struggle against the Taliban. And it is very useful. And in the last two months that we did these actions, it has um, very good um, impacts on the moral of the NDSF. So, sorry, yeah. you've actually raised um, a very, very large number of military questions um, and, and complex military questions as well, I think, <laughs> which if you don't mind, I think that would be an ideal point if we could bring in Brigadier Ben Barry, because um, Obviously, the questions you're raising are, are, are largely for a foreign audience about how does this support continue for the Afghan government, the Afghan military, and what happens next for the Afghan military, the intelligence, the, um, the um, flight control, um, air support, etc. And I think, Brigadier Barry, uh, it would be very nice if you could answer some of those questions or give some indication for Mr. Afzali. Thanks. Um the previous speaker has been very clear on the strengths and weaknesses of the ANDSF, particularly the dependence of the Air Force on contract maintenance and <coughs> supply, supply of weapons. I'm afraid that over the last five years, um, I've seen a slow but steady shifting of advantage on the battlefield in favour of the Taliban. And I'm afraid this trend continued since the Dovar Agreement the Taliban has appeared to cease its attacks on international forces, but has continued to attack uh, government forces. And of course, we saw this dreadful campaign of assassination over the last winter, uh, waged in Kabul and other cities, targeting members of the judiciary, government administration, media, and a significant number of working women attack. Uh, since the Doha agreement, the US support to Afghan, Afghan forces appears to have diminished. And it's not clear to me that the ANDSF can count on any US air support after September. Now, Washington has said that it will continue to support the Afghan government and security forces, including with funding. Uh, US and NATO troops have begun withdrawing and CENTCOM said today uh, they'd already removed about 25% of their capability. It's likely that the considerable numbers of US contractors will withdraw but there appears to be consideration of their providing support from outside Afghanistan, particularly important for the maintenance of the Air Force's aircraft. Without US forces in country, uh, Washington's ability to gather intelligence will reduce considerably. Indeed, the CIA director told Congress a couple of months ago, and I quote, when the time comes for the US military to withdraw, the US government's ability to collect on act on threats will diminish. That's simply a fact. Now, the president has said, President Biden has said that the US will maintain the ability to monitor and, if necessary, attack any international terrorists operating in the country. It doesn't seem yet to have negotiated any over the horizon basing agreements with any of the neighboring states. Indeed, Pakistani politicians are publicly opposing any US bases there. And the Taliban are threatening to attack any US bases in the region probably as an attempt to deter states from hosting them. Now, the US, of course, can use its many satellites and it can base drones, aircraft, intelligence facilities and reconnaissance and strike aircraft in the Gulf, at the British island of Diego Garcia or on aircraft carriers in the Indian Ocean or any combination of those. 
which does, of course, assume that Taliban is going to allow uh, US aircraft to transit through its airspace. CENTCOM commander General McKenzie told the Senate Armed Services Committee that once the US left its Afghan bases, both detecting and attacking international terrorists based in Afghanistan would become more difficult. For example, drones fly flying from bases outside Afghanistan would take much longer to get where they were needed in Afghan skies. And I'm afraid there's an, there's an uncomfortable uh, factor that reduced US intelligence capabilities would mean that any attacks the US chose to mount by missiles, air, or special forces, or some combination of them, would be more likely to inadvertently cause civilian casualties. So where is the war now from a military point of view? Uh, last month, the US Director of National Intelligence issued his global intelligence assessment. And I'll just read what it said about Afghanistan. Kabul continues to face setbacks on the battlefield and the Taliban is confident that it can achieve military victory. We assess that prospects for a peace deal remain low during the next year. The Taliban is likely to make gains on the battlefield and the Afghan government will struggle uh, to hold the Taliban at bay if the coalition withdraws. It gives me no pleasure um, to agree with this assessment. And once the US and NATO forces withdraw, the US will have less influence over the Afghan forces and less influence on the Kabul government. It will have even less influence than it does now over the Taliban, other than attempting to coerce the Taliban by using force, which will be more difficult without uh, forces or bases in the country. Um, I think that's about it. Back to you, Martin. Ben, thank you very much. It's a complex situation and I think we're likely to come back to more of the military aspects in due course, especially what will happen um, to and with the Taliban. Um, but first, we have, a, we have a lot of questions. So to our audience members, please bear with us. I have a note of all the questions and, uh, and we will come to them. But first, if we could ask Lady Olga Maitland of Defence and Security Forum to, to kick off with the first question for the panel. Well, thank you very much indeed. And may I give a very heartfelt thank you to our extremely brave Afghan members of parliament. They are very humbling for us to, to listen to each in their own turn. We've heard very graphic description of the military threats, the attacks, both on uh, all levels of civil society. And I must say the presentation by uh, Ms. Nahid Farid about the threats to women is something I totally understand and sympathize. One area I'd like to explore a bit more is this, um, the peace negotiation with the Taliban, which seems to be at a fairly low ebb. Um, would our panelists like to describe to us how the process is moving and what might be the kind of the best opportunity to put pressure on them to actually begin to live in a civilized way? Do, who would they respond to? Who would have the best leverage with the Taliban to move from being a battle force to being a sensible uh, government force? How, uh, how does the process moving on? Because at the end of the day, some accommodation with the Taliban will be made and I'd rather see it before the whole country is flattened. Um, perhaps we could hear a little bit more detail um, from our very admirable members of parliament. So, uh, Olga Maitland is asking um, what sort of accommodation could be reached with the Taliban? Um, do they have a role in government and do you think you can deal with them? Um, are they going to be responsible actors or are they going to keep fighting, would you say? And also, indeed, who would put the most influence on them to as a moderator or as a kind of go-between? Which country? Yeah. Uh, actually, as a moderator, I would say that basically uh, some of the neighbor countries, especially Pakistan, they have, uh, I think, more leverage on them, especially with the recent uh, role of UK, as also which is getting involved together with Pakistan. I think uh, um, that that's a good move to keep the pressure on and try to work as a moderator. They do have a leverage, in my opinion, and we appreciate the UK's uh, support in this case. Uh, as for the, the Taliban, we have seen some changes recently from uh, them. Uh, 
we believe that if Taliban will be defeated on the battlefield, uh, they will basically definitely will come to the table and try to negotiate a, a deal. Uh, or in another word, they will get more serious and peace process. However, if they will not be defeated in the battlefield, uh, definitely, you know, they, they're trying to basically not get serious. They will not really come to the negotiation table. They will not try to reach to a, a deal. So here that the whole focus, what we are trying to make is basically the answer is what will happen in the battlefield. If uh, uh, the, uh, my colleagues has give, given the details of the ground situation and the, and the supports which we need from the uh, from all the uh, NATO allies and especially US, UK and other uh, NATO member countries uh, for our NDSF in order to keep NDSF strong and to really support them to make sure Taliban will not take more territory by force, definitely Taliban will come into the table and will hopefully reach to a deal. So recently, the reason I say that there, was, there is some changes into their attitude because they, initially they were thinking that they, they will take more provinces, they will take more territories. Yes, still four districts has been captured by them, but even in some of the, those districts, the way they played was the Taliban has used the elders of those districts to convince you know, some of the commanders from the NDSF side uh, so that they will, without fighting some of the places so that they can hand it over to Taliban. Uh, however, uh, uh, recently, maybe you, you have also heard that Mullah brother had attended a meeting in Doha. He did mention that they wanna uh, uh, speed up the, uh, the negotiations. Uh, and that was the first time this, uh, we, we have seen such a uh, action from them. So, and we believe that since they couldn't take much territories in Afghanistan by force, they are also trying to proceed with the negotiations. So here, it's basically the both sides of the coin. Keep, keeping pressure on Taliban on the battlefield so they, they understand that they cannot take it by force and then definitely they will come into the negotiations. So and it will be basically they, uh, they will take the negotiation process or the peace process uh, uh, more seriously. Uh, this is how we believe. So in another word is basically if they really understand that they cannot take Afghanistan by force, that's how they're going to take it more serious. And Pakistan definitely has a leverage on them. And I believe with the recent uh, uh, involvement from the UK side, which you, you might have heard that Bajwa and as well as the Mr. Karta came to Kabul. I believe then also there was some good discussions we heard. So we, we are hoping that uh, both sides will take more uh, the peace process seriously. And uh, finally, we will reach hopefully to some uh, 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 final deal. But I think... Uh, it will be, everything will be killed on the battlefield. Let's see. Thank you very much, Mr. Romani. Um, could I switch across Roddy Gal, a chairman of Asia Scotland Institute. Roddy, um, do you have a question for the panelists, please? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for an extremely interesting discussion so far. We've heard it said that the Taliban, are, there is a split between the older members of the Taliban and the very many younger members. Uh, there. And I would like to ask the panel the question of to what extent are they a unified force? And is there a chance that dealing with, if you like, the next generation of Taliban may bring them more to their senses? Can I can I answer yeah. this question? Oh, please, Mr. Martin? Go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, Taliban use this narrative that they have been changed and they are uh, the new generation of Taliban are more modernized. But we didn't see any indication of change so far in the areas that are under control of Taliban. There is no single school, girls school that is open. They continue their suppression of people. Uh, the level of uh, their uh, extreme is, is elevated, rather re reduced. So that means and shows that Taliban did not change. Although they said they changed, they used this um, oppression as a weapon to, um, to uh, show the level of their extreme and uh, the, the fundamentalism that they are uh, using uh, is their uh, leverage uh, to, um, to define themselves, okay? To define themselves. And if you take this violence from them, if you take uh, gun from them, if you take uh, extremis ex extremism out of uh, their mind, uh, they, they won't be Taliban. So 
in practice and in principles. Taliban are the same. From the last 20 years, we didn't in see any indication of change from, from Taliban. Even if they say, even if Taliban uh, and some media in Pakistan continue saying that, uh, the reality is still there, that Taliban are the same Taliban uh, that has been in the darkness regime of Taliban in 90s. Ms. Farid, uh, thank you very much. If, if I could just ask a follow-on question from that, uh, from one of the audience, um, Mark uh, Hartree um, has asked, are there Afghan women with influence on the Taliban? Uh, please excuse me if that sounds a naive question for, from me as well, because we, we all know the history of the Taliban uh, and, and how they ruled Afghanistan before, but are there any women with, Af with influence over the Taliban? Um, Actually, uh, Taliban are a uh, different phenomena. They don't want to hear. Uh, that's the problem. Um, they even uh, they even don't keep the promises they sign. How we can influence a group that uh, close every door of negotiation, and uh, they are under the command of a country like Pakistan, and. Uh, uh, it is it is not easy. They didn't even hear the government, the whole government of Afghanistan. They didn't even hear the different groups of scholars and think tanks that had their demand. We demanded that they reopen the girls' school in their areas if they want to show to the people of Afghanistan that, that they has been changed. We gave different declaration in Afghanistan parliament, uh, asking them to indicate some of the changes that they they claim, but they didn't. So uh, I think that's why we hold these sessions. It's very important to have international community, United States uh, and other players to put pressure on Taliban and also Pakistan to hear us, to hear Afghan women, to hear the new Afghanistan, to, to hear 50% of the community that uh, are women, 70% of Afghanistan society that are youth the emerging scholars and uh, different uh, media outlets that are practicing democracy and freedom of speech in Afghanistan. These are the realities. They are part of, the Taliban are part of the reality, not the whole reality of Afghanistan. And we have to let them know and, uh, and we have to enforce this uh, on them. Otherwise, they continue to close their eyes and fight and kill and do the brutality and bloodshed and at the end of the day this is women of afghanistan that suffer the most as the most valuable part of the society thank you very much Ms. Fahid. i think um, very open honest opinions um uh, uh, mir haida afzali are, are you are you available i have a question from the audience i think i'd like to put to you to let you come back on um, yes yes i can hear you yes yes um I, if i could i'd like to, to bring back in the issue of what other countries can do in afghanistan um and we have a question from uh mr nozumu takoka uh, takoka san who is the japanese consul general in uh, scotland um and his question is how much positive impact was made for the stability and nation building efforts of afghanistan by support and contributions from countries like japan uh, he, he'd also mentioned he'd like to express his, his gratitude to the Afghan United in Glasgow um, uh, about their, their solidarity when Dr. Nakamura was tragically killed in Afghanistan in 2019. And, and we have several other questions about the role of other countries in Afghanistan. So I think we, we tend to dwell on the United States and the junior part of the United Kingdom militarily to some extent, but obviously these are not the only countries that can contribute to Afghanistan. Japan has um, a very strong recent history of, um, of contributing to um, economic and political development in many countries in Asia. H how would you like to see other countries apart from the US and UK contributing to Afghanistan in the future? Thank you very much. Uh, let me tell you one thing very clearly that uh, we have achieved uh, too much things in the last 20 years by supporting of international community. One of that country is uh, Japan. Uh, as you mentioned about Nakamura, he is still in the um, heart of every Afghan inside Afghanistan, and we respect him. And also let me thanks on behalf of Afghanistan people from the people of Japan from their support in the last 20 years. They have supported us in various 
um, 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 parts. They have donated us the scholarships. They have built for us um, hospitals. They have built for us the schools. They have built for us um, the streets, roads. And I think if I'm um, right, that um, annually they have donated us more than 300 scholarships in the last 20, uh, 20 years. And right now we have um, so many people which are well educated and they are in the high level of the government that they have been trained in the Japan. They are in a master and doctor degree, especially in engineering and in municipality field. Let me thanks from them. And also about the international community, we have gained lots of things in the last 20 years. We have, um, right now, we have um, in universities, right now we have uh, schools. Uh, let me tell you one thing that in 2001, either we didn't have one girls that um, she was not uh, entered to the school. Right now we have more than 500 thousand um, girls uh, which are in the school and uh, and also we have girls in the universities we have um, um, infrastructures we have gained uh, freedom of species we have uh, indecent it is it was impossible in 2001 that uh, if you think that one day our indecent will struggle against the taliban by their own field these achievements is very vital these achievements um, are, are, are very important for Afghanistan people. There are some red lines that Afghanistan people are not re ready to deal um, on it with the, with the Taliban, especially the, the gains that we have in we have had in the last 20 years, like uh, freedom of speech, human rights, women rights, um, and education, NDSF. These are not these were not possible without the contribution of international communities and big countries like Japan, um, UK. United States of America. And let me give you an example of UK support on the, our army. Right now, we have our um, defense academy name is San Horse. And you know that you have San Horse in the UK. The, the, the curriculum which is teaching right now in San Horse, it is similar to the curriculum of San Horse in the UK. The capability of our students, which are right now um, uh, under the education in the in the academy, they're uh, similar to the academy of San Jose in the London in, in in the UK. These are the achievements that we have had in the last twenty years, and we want to continue, and we would want to go through these paths. Mr. Afzali, that's a very good point at the end, and, and on that point, if I could bring back in Ben Barry, um, Ben, Ben, not to ask you about Sandhurst. Uh, and, and not to ask Roddy Gow about Sandhurst either, because I think it was Roddy's last posting in the army. But um, but I have a question from the audience from, from Neil Gow. Um, so Neil has asked, the British Army did a lot of work training the Afghan National Army and police. Does the panel think they have the ability to control the Taliban and hold them to account? Uh, and, and obviously, in, in respect for our, for our friends in Afghanistan, um, let, let, let's have some professional comments, Ben, on your professional view of what is what is needed for the Afghan army and the Afghan National Police to combat the Taliban going forward? We heard from several of the Afghan friends on the panel that um, that they need to be defeated. Is that possible? What what is possible? <laughs> the strength and the capability of the Afghan forces as they stand. From my point of view, which of course is out of country. Um, it does seem to me the balance on the battlefield is very, it's, it, it is on a knife, a knife edge. And you could see a worst case scenario that particularly if the Afghan Air Force capability reduces, the Afghan forces ability to gain leverage over the Taliban uh, would significantly reduce. I think I'd agree with Mir Haider Afzali from everything that I see with his excellent analysis of the strengths of the Afghan forces, particularly the special operations forces and um, the, current, the current weaknesses. So quite clearly the US and Afghanistan's uh, friends in the international community ought to be seeking to support the Afghan forces, albeit without personnel in the country. So providing maintenance and training outside the, outside the country um, will be very important. Continuing the funding for the Afghan forces will also be important. I think, although I, I've reflected on the judgment of the CIA director and the CENTCOM commander, that gathering intelligence will be more difficult, it won't be impossible. You know, I think the British and the Americans, for example, are continuing to plan on having embassies in Kabul, 
Kabul after, sept after September. So I think it's very important that where they can, the Friends of Afghanistan um, continue to support the National Directorate of Security uh, with cooperation over intelligence gathering as well. But I, I defer to Mr. Haider Afzali, of course. A, a good point to bring you back in. Sorry, Mr. Afzali, we cut you off before, but, um, but please carry on. What would you like to say about the, the military outlook again? Uh, thank you very much. Just I want to answer this very short that if the Taliban think that they will be succeeded by military, it is impossible. Fortunately, our ENDSF have the capability to, to, to um, defend from our country. But it is true that the Taliban can make us challenge in some area, which they have did in last two months and in, 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 in past um, years. They can make us challenge, but they cannot collapse any center of the province. The two things is very important for support of our ANDSF. The first thing is keeping funding, continuation of the funding of the ANDSF in the range that is right now going on. If it increased, this will be very appreciated. If it, if, if it is um, any possibility to increase the funding of the ANDSF. The other thing is aviation forces, as I mentioned before, the maintaining and the um, repairing of these uh, aircraft is um, contracted to the foreigners. It's still, unfortunately, we didn't find any replacement for them. And if they continue the, the, the repairing and maintenance of these aircraft, I'm sure that we will defeat the Taliban in coming months and the Taliban will not reach to their plans which they um, took. Thank you very much. I think it's a complex question, and we could, we could keep we could have the entire webinar, I think, talking about the military outlook. But we have to move on to some of the political issues as well. And uh, in that regard, could we come back to um, Haji Ajmal Romani, um, Mr. Romani? Um, yes, thank you. Um, I have several questions I'd like to put to you from from the audience, if I could, about the Parliament. So, from from Giles Chance um, asks, do the Afghan people support democracy? And Christina Feng has asked, what is the parliament's role in negotiation with the Taliban? And she says, if parliament is committed to its people and has people's confidence, would it be difficult for the Taliban to gain control and support? So could, could you talk to us a little bit more about the role of the parliament, how you can gain the support of um, more people across Afghanistan and how in gaining that support, you can counter the Taliban? How, how do you see that? First of all, uh, uh, we have uh, MPs from all over Afghanistan, from all provinces, all districts, and from all ethnic groups. So those MPs, they understand, uh, uh, they have a better understanding of the people on that regional districts. So through those MPs, we can have a better, uh, those MPs can be a better broker for the people and they can also better discuss and, uh, and explain and campaign uh, to the people if we believe that the, uh, the, the way the peace process is happening is in the best interest of the, uh, Afghanistan. So uh, that I think uh, Afghanistan parliament is, uh, and in peace has a better mandate and they can better play a role and by and, 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 and uh, each MP in its own province, in its own district, in its own place. Uh, Afghanistan, as we all know, it's a, a tribe-based country. So every MP from that district basically uh, uh, has a better understanding of that ethnic group or that basically tribe, I would say. So this way, uh, we have a better uh, leverage on the people or we can better explain them or we can better communicate with them. On the other side, the way we played our role so far, I would like to give an example of the budget when we were dealing with the budget or at the time of the budget, the last year budget, uh, when we were dealing with them, which uh, it was already uh, back and forward between the uh, parliament and the, and the administrations. And uh, there was lots of issues with the budget and it took like uh, more than two months that we, till we really settled it. And it was uh, rejected two times, uh, one, uh, 17, uh, one time with the 17 points very clearly and second time with the 19 points. So people can see also uh, that we are their voice can be heard, who is working really uh, for their betterment. So that's how we believe we can have the support on them. And that's why more than 15 provinces went for you know, very big rally and demonstrations on the streets. So, and they threatened the government that if they will not listen to the parliament, 
which is basically their uh, they the, on the budget it was an issue of the budget and uh, with their right in this case uh, so we will continue our demonstrations so that's how we believe but perhaps could could i could i pass to mr afsali as well for that question H how do you see um, parliament and the members of parliament gaining support to counter the taliban is is this possible mr afsali uh, thank you very much as my colleague said that um, in field of the counter to the taliban or struggling against the taliban all the parliament uh, plus government are unified because the Taliban thought, uh, think, and the Taliban regime is the regime that the people of Afghanistan don't want. And we don't um, go back, in, in, we don't want to go back, and the people of Afghanistan desire is not the, the Taliban desire. They want a, a regime that we, we don't have a democracy. Uh, they want a regime that the women rights and human rights um, we, uh, not be obligated. And it is very important for Afghanistan people. And uh, Parliament uh, played a good role in last two years, um, especially when the new terms uh, of the Parliament started in the new period, I mean, 17 period of the Parliament. Well-educated um, youngs are in the Parliament, inside the Parliament. They have good connection with the, with the international community. They know the value of democracy. They know the value of human and human rights. Uh, human rights, and they preserve the, the humans and women rights. It is because that in the in, in the field of the Taliban and struggling again is the Taliban plus terrorism plus Al Qaeda and Daesh. We are unified with the government of Afghanistan plus the people of Afghanistan, and we don't want to go back. Thank you very much, both of you. I mean, very powerful words um, on that subject. I'd like to stop there if we could and, and, and really thank um, Haji Ajmal Rahmani, Mir Haider Afzali, Nahid Farid and, and Brigadier Ben Barry. Um, absolutely fascinating comments from all of you. Um, and, and I think we, we have to keep watching Afghanistan and understanding what happens in the next several months. Could I hand back to our chairman, please, Roddy Gal, um, for, for closing remarks. Thank you very much, Roddy. Martin, uh, thanks to you and to the team and to Olga Maitland. Uh, for having set up this uh, extremely interesting event. Uh, thanks also to, to Martin and to Gavin for their involvement. Uh, it's very rarely that we have the chance to hear directly from members of the administration in Afghanistan. There are a lot of ideas floating around in the press. Some of them uh, are very pessimistic, others guardedly optimistic. Uh, and in that respect, I'm grateful to, to bring Ben Barry for his comments. But we would like to reassure you uh, on the panel that we think of you a great deal. We are very concerned about Afghanistan and we are keen to know what we can do to be helpful. It would seem to me that pretty quickly we should do something to exert some pressure on the whole issue of the, the maintenance, repair and resupply of uh, both land and air resources to enable you to use those to, to the greatest effect. But above all, to the people of Afghanistan, men and importantly, women, we, we are thinking of you here in Scotland and elsewhere on this call. Uh, we, we wish you well, we admire your courage. And uh, as someone whose son has, has twice been in Afghanistan and returned fortunately safely, uh, we've all one way or another uh, done our part. So to all those who've arranged the panelists and the panel, thank you. This is a very important subject for the Asia Scotland Institute whose mission is to educate and inspire and inform tomorrow's leaders within Scotland and the United Kingdom. So Martin, thanks to you and the team and to, to Rick who's on the call. Thank you all very much indeed.